to another episode of the nonprofit show. We have a lot to talk about, my friend, and this is going to be a lot of fun. But before we get going, I've just got to do a couple housekeeping things. I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jarrett Ransom, my trusty sidekick, is traveling today. She'll be back with us tomorrow. We want to make sure that we thank all of our presenting sponsors. Without them, we would not have this conversation. And I've got to say, YPTC was one of those first people that joined us. We are now marching towards 600 episodes. So we want to make sure that we thank Bloomerang, your part-time controller, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Nerd, Fundraising Academy, Staffing Boutique, and Nonprofit That Thought Leader. And again, you can find us on Roku, YouTube, Vimeo, Amazon Fire TV, and now our episodes are on podcasts. So cue us up. Um, and when you're vacuuming or going for a walk or doing whatever, maybe going back to your office and you're in traffic, mm -hmm. check us out because we're there. Okay, Jennifer, my friend, again, you were that lifeline to all of this craziness that started now almost three years ago. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And I said we were on the getting on the other side of it, but there's still implications in what we're going to talk about today uh, with the labor market, right. big time. You know, it's, it's fascinating to me to have your wisdom on this because, you know, we think, oh, accounting, finance, they, they're looking at the ledgers. They're not going to see any of this. But in so many ways, you're on the front lines of this. And so your voice is amazing um, to give us some perspective. So. I'm going to start off by having you define the great resignation. I like your words, the great re-evaluation. Yes. What is that? So, so we have all heard about the great resignation. Uh, it's a term that was coined by Adam, uh, Anthony, Anthony Klotz. I heard him on an Adam Grant podcast recently. Uh, it defines the fact that 47 million people left their jobs in 2021 and that trend continued in 2022 and i have the question you know, where did all the people go uh, where did they go yeah. but during the pandemic what happened was uh many people left their jobs uh, many women left their jobs because of childcare issues kids were home schooled and uh daycares were closed uh, also a lot of individuals on the you know uh, more experienced end of their career towards retirement, took the um, opportunity to retire during the pandemic. Um, and But the lockdowns had a lot of people questioning, what else? What do I want to do with my life now? And that's where I I say I coined, but actually Dan Trich in our, uh, I think you met, you know, Dan. Uh, I love Dan in Trich. Our, uh, in our Phoenix office. Yeah. Uh, more on yeah, dance dance doing lots of things around the country now too yeah. uh he he told me it was called the great evaluate re-evaluation so i call it the great re-evaluation people are re-evaluating their work uh nonprofit leaders are really re-evaluating their work um nonprofits just in general um the staff there are uh, leaving 60% more than the regular labor force. So we're really having a crisis in the nonprofit sector. That uh, stat comes from SHRM, the Society of Human Resources Management. Okay, so, so that's a real all levels. crisis. That, that's not just, is that more on the, the C-suite or that's just like- there, there, It's way. all across the board, but just recently in the Chronicle of Philanthropy in May, there was an article called large numbers of nonprofit leaders are stepping down and the competition uh, to find new ones is fierce. And it is, it really is. Uh, and it's both in the C-suite of nonprofits and throughout the organizations. And what's happening is people are burnt out. Uh, in the nonprofit sector, they're really reevaluating the situation. Now they stayed during the crisis, and it was a lot on people. They were you know, scrambling to keep their organizations alive, staying afloat. They were figuring out the pandemic funding and what they were going to do with that, and trying to serve their constituents. So uh, I guess you know now it's two and a half years in, and people are saying you know what, how about me? And I, I've, I've been through a lot and now I might be looking for a more 
a, a better place, greener grass, if you will, um, where it's not so stressful. You know, it's so fascinating that you would say this. I, I have spoken to two different CEOs on different topics um, in the last like three weeks. And both of these people, just as an aside, had, mm -hmm. had told me that they had put off some major medical interventions because they were going to have to take medical leave and they were afraid to leave their nonprofit because yeah. they just didn't, they, they you know, their, their client base had gone up, their, their labor force had dropped, everything that you were talking about. And they had imperiled themselves to where they're going to have to both leave, you know, and one is in the West Coast, one is in the East Coast. I mean, it was, it's been heartbreaking. And I've got to believe, to your point, this is being played out. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing it all the time, uh, very much so in the finance area uh, that where we work. But we're, we're also seeing it because we work with 1400 nonprofit organizations. Uh, we're seeing it in uh, their struggle to find staff uh, all throughout. And um, so I'll give a plug too. But I think one of the big things nonprofits should be thinking about is succession planning, uh, especially in the executive director level, because that is where it can really so disrupt your operations if you have an executive leave, a CFO, a, uh, a director of development. Uh, so succession planning, uh, thinking about what could happen next is super important. And uh, I will direct the audience to a uh, webinar that we just did two weeks ago um, featuring David Harris, who was has yeah, been on this been on show. show. Uh, who is the head of Interim Executive Solutions, and Patrice Keegan, who is the former head of Boston Cares and now serves as an Interim Executive Director. Um, and so we had them on a web, uh, webinar two weeks ago, so see that at our website, yptc.com, and it goes all into what you should be doing to uh, you know, best practices for succession planning, what you should be doing now to get ready. So when we talk about that, Jennifer, and, and I love that you can give us another resource and these implications um can you give us a little bit more of a picture that might help some of us understand why mm -hmm. that planning is so important it's not just that individual it's right. it's the culture the cost <laughs> okay yes yeah, so those are the cost so um givebetter.com uh, is a website that uh, you may have heard of, and and uh, have them on. Uh, they they have a, a stat on here that studies estimate that losing an employee can cost a company one and a half to two times an employee's salary. This takes into consideration hiring, onboarding, training, ramp up time, um, and loss of engagement of other staff. You you forget about that too. That in addition, you know, when someone leaves, then there could be um, just a circular, you know, things start going downhill in the organization because there's just um, creates negativity. People leave and then other people start thinking about leaving. Um, so it's the cost is um, it depends on who is leaving, what it really costs. Uh, so in for you know, a, a staff member, it might be like fifteen hundred dollars. All these things. This is this is again give better stats here, um, but it could be for a technical person in your nonprofit, it could be a hundred to one hundred and fifty percent of their salary, and then in the C suite, it could be almost two hundred percent of an employee's salary. This so it's expensive when staff leave. And again, I mentioned before, it's the cost of that transition time, but it's also the interruption, potential interruption to your mission. Right. What happens when these people leave to your constituents and being able to fulfill that mission? Yeah. And I love that you brought that up because I think a lot of times when we enter into this discussion, we're we're playing, you know, as my mother would say, with scared money, and <laughs> we're looking at what's right in front of us, and we lose sight of that, and then it's too late. It's it's just so catastrophic when you lose sight of that, um, because generally, not such good things have happened to alert you to how your constituency is suffering. 
or yeah, not? It's, it's a real thing. I mean, um, okay. if you're not planning appropriately, say, you know, a, a, an executive director just up and leaving a nonprofit organization uh, and giving two weeks notice is not ideal. That's where I go back to the succession planning and what needs to happen there. And certainly um, it, it's hard to fill the, that those um, shoes of an executive director. What's a board to do? Typically a board member will jump right in and, and help out. Um, perhaps, perhaps there's somebody on staff that could jump in to um, meet an interim you know, situation, but it, it's a tough one when somebody up and leaves. Now in the CFO role, it's, you know, I, I think it's a little bit easier because there's firms like your part-time controller that could step right in and fill that role um, very quickly. And I guess I would say on the executive director role, I have to give David Harris a plug too, because uh, he would say interim executive solutions could jump right in on the executive director side, but without lack of, you know, without, you know, significant planning on that side, it really becomes tough. You know, um, I'm so fascinated by so much of this and I'm wondering, um, one of the things that I've always been fascinated by you and all your team, you seem to come to the table with a lot more knowledge and observation than just the accounting and, and the finance piece. And I'm wondering if you, as another implication of what, what's going on, if you, your people are being brought in and, and asking, being asked to actually talk about these other things like HR and programming and things that are not really in the purview of the accounting and finance, because the yeah. more I speak with you and your team, it seems like they're now having to talk about things that are management and fundraising and marketing and not just the cost and the invoices and the reporting. I mean, yeah. is that fair to say? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, what I always say is um, accounting sees everything. Everything goes <laughs> through accounting. You know, all, every, all of the transactions, financial and non-financial, uh, you're seeing when you're in the, the mm -hmm. finance role where you should be because you're talking to programs on a regular basis. You're talking to the executive management. You're talking to the development department. Um, you, and sometimes we're, the linkage between all of these different departments as well. So indeed, there is a lot of um, opportunity for us to help in and, and recognize. And I'm not going to say we're going to give advice, uh, HR advice, or you know how to do a capital campaign, because that's not our area of expertise. But we could recognize different issues that people are telling us about in that uh, in each department and then bring them up to executive management. And not that they don't know that, but hearing that from another um, uh, outside consultant uh, often helps facilitate the conversation in the organization for uh, needed changes in all areas, not just the finance. Okay, so you've shared with us about what you're seeing and how, you know, this is bubbled up and it's going to continue on. This isn't just going to be solved um, in the next 60, 90, 120 days, largely because of this demographic shift. And I've got yes. to ask you this curveball. Your son plays baseball, so <laughs> or bunt. I should say I'm bunt. familiar with the curveballs. Yes, it's a tough one. <laughs> yes. You know, this is making me think, is this a good opportunity or a time of opportunity for people who want to elevate their careers up into that C-suite or think, oh man, I, I, I want to be an ED, but that's 10 years down the road where now maybe things are like, okay, hey, you, you're getting tapped on the shoulder. Or do you, you see know, that? Yes. I mean, I think it is a good opportunity for so many people in so many ways to step up. And um, I would say even within our firm, you know, we might have been thinking and re-evaluating a lot of different um, strategies that we might have taken, like right after, right before the um, uh, the pandemic, we were thinking about going national, mm -hmm. and uh, we probably would have stayed, you know, thinking and re-evaluating that, we're evaluating that for months and months, and then after we were able to switch all of our clients uh, at that time, remote in just several days, we're like. Hey, we can do this. Yes, and then we needed a leader of uh, to help us in uh, expanding throughout the nation. And 
we wouldn't have tapped that person necessarily to do that um, in normal times or, uh, you know, I'm sure we would have come to that conclusion, but it would have been months and months down the road. And we would have, you know, so I think it's a great, um, uh, so there's great similarities in other organizations that are now having to reevaluate their strategy in so many ways. And one of those strategies is succession planning to look at individuals with different backgrounds uh, and experience to take over that executive director or in other you know, leadership roles. Now, I would say in the CFO role, that's a little tougher because you do have to have yeah. some financial expertise yeah. to do that. And executive directors obviously also have you know, a list of uh, core competencies that they need to have and people need to meet that. But you, there's, I think, so much opportunity for individuals uh, to step up and uh, be part of it. Because as you mentioned, the demographics are really, it's not in our favor right now. No, it's pushing it. So we, we've been talking about that aspect with our C-suite and our nonprofits. Now, if you can jump over into the accounting and finance labor market, because we all need this work, whether we're outsourcing or we have somebody in the cubicle next to us, yeah. this is a key part so what does yeah. it look like for our sector and getting so, this, this brain trust? Yeah, just in general, the accounting profession is struggling to get people. I just did a uh, presentation for the Pennsylvania Institute of uh, CPAs, their Women's Leadership Conference, and just did a whole presentation on the accounting profession and um, the struggles that we might be having, but also the real benefits of being an accountant. And it, I think it's awesome. And I, my whole presentation was like, accounting is awesome. But um, but we're not, we're seeing a tough trend right now. The um, uh, graduates of accounting of in, with accounting degrees and master degrees, uh, bachelor's and master's degrees are really coming down. Um, it's an 8.6% decline since 2016. Uh, wow. Also really trending down is CPA, you know, certified public accountant candidates. Uh, those taking the test is really coming down as well. Um, so Part of it is just demographics. There's less people in college right now. Um, it's just a, a that younger set. Uh, there's less people, uh, but there's also just you know, um, you know kind, of, kind of gets a bad rap sometimes in finance, and I would like to change that around. Um, and also, I think re some of the reasons it gets a bad rap is the um, overworked. You know, the, the number of hours uh, some public accounting firms. Uh, have people working and some of the culture in, uh, in some organizations is not as strong. And I think that's why we're at your part-time controller, um, you know, able to uh, attract and retain uh, a lot of accountants <laughs> and, uh, and specifically to work in the nonprofit industry. So um, that's, it's a problem for nonprofits trying to find finance staff because of this trend in the um, in just the sector, the accounting sector overall, and then you think about the amount of money that a nonprofit might be able to offer a finance professional, then it's it, it makes it even tougher. So that's uh, you know there's a lot of things going against the uh, nonprofit sector in the finance world finding full time staff for their accounting departments. But there's a solution. <laughs> you know, I love that you said that because now I'm thinking this has got to bleed over into our board service and committee yeah. service. Yeah. Finding a robust audit uh, or finance um, and audit committees. Yeah. It's not just who's doing, you know, the actual reconciliation of the accounts. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's, it's the brain trust. It's people understanding so how to do finance for your nonprofit. Yeah, it's always been a struggle for organizations that I've seen. Um, this is just, you know, what I've seen at uh, the organizations we work with and boards I've sat on, um, finding uh, the, the appropriate financial advisors for your board. Uh, so this is probably going to sadly be a tougher 
uh, situation for nonprofits going forward. But I was going to say on the outsource side, you know, even though it's a, a struggle, I think, well, I think it's going to be a continued struggle for nonprofits to find full-time accounting and finance staff. I mean, outsourcing is really a great option. I know I am biased, but, <laughs> but it really is. I mean, you're getting the expert, you, expert expertise, easy for me to say, that you need when you need it better financial reporting, better analysis and recommendations, because you're going to you have a firm standing behind the individual that's working for you at the organization. And you don't have to worry about supervision. You're not supervising that person. You have a firm that's supporting them, but you have a person that has, like we mentioned before, all of these other great recommendations for the whole organization. And um, often has the ear of the executive director some, sometimes more than a, a nonprofit finance person might because of the fact that it's an outside party. Um, and real biggie, the real biggie on this is that turnover uh, is one thing that nonprofit executive directors don't have to worry about in the finance department when they outsource because the firm handles that. Okay, so then let's get you to talk a little bit about that because now I'm going to get you to get out that crystal ball, shine it up for us. <laughs> <laughs> but when you talk about this, I mean, outsourcing across the way from legal to HR to, I mean, yeah. so many things. This is kind of like a new way for us to think. What are you seeing as part of these these inputs for the great reevaluation? Well, I think outsourcing general, uh, your non-core competencies is a great way to go um, to solve any staffing issue, whether it's in HR, finance, legal, um, uh, even executives in the short term, um, interim executive solutions. Uh, it is, uh, you can outsource your non-core competencies. You're not great at HR. There's firms out there that can help you do that. Where you don't have the staff that you can um, attract and, and retain in that department, those that's a great solution for you. But I also think, you know, in general for attracting and retaining staff at a nonprofit across the board, um, outsourcing is one thing to consider. But I really think you have to reevaluate. This is coming to the reevaluation of your your organization. What about your culture? Yeah, is this place somewhere that a person really wants to work and stay? I think nonprofits are at a great advantage uh, to attract and retain staff because of the fact that they work in a mission based life. Yeah. They're helping people directly every single day. So that is a great sale, a great sell, if you will, if uh, in and of its own. But there has to be more for people because they're burnout, as we mentioned before. So you have to be reevaluating your value proposition. What are you offering your staff? Uh, what is your value proposition to your staff besides helping the world become a better place, which is a great reason why to go to for a nonprofit organization. But nonprofits have to think about you know, salary, benefits, time off, flexibility. Those are the biggies that I think about when uh, we talk about the value proposition of any organization when I think about your part-time controller. But um, I was reading again on the, it was at the Give Better uh, site, was uh, stop worrying about the overhead myth, invest in your people. Yeah. And the overhead myth, meaning you, know, you, you have to only uh, spend money on programs and focus on your programs, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But if you don't think about investing in your people right now, you're going to um, have this potential uh, risk of turnover and um, not being able to retain attract and retain the staff that you want to have. Well, it was chilling. And we started off this conversation and you bandied about you know, like 125% of the, the, the annual cost of, yeah. a, of an employee. Yeah. Oh my God, that's like real money. Yeah. That, yeah. And, and that's just what we that, can see. That's just what we can see. That's not right. all and, these other intangibles. 
all the other intangibles about hurting, you know, um, the, the struggle to your mission, the struggle to morale of the rest of your staff, all of that. And, um, you know, preventing burnout, I think, is another thing nonprofits can do right away. We're thinking about that and addressing it with their staff, um, which is you know, balance everyone's workload. Look, evaluate what everyone's doing uh, currently and seeing where you can um, balance out. Can you outsource some of the activities? Uh, can you make some of your processes more streamlined so people aren't doing mundane rote work? And that's really, you know, when I talk about the accounting profession, that's really where we're going too. It has to happen, it has right? To happen. And it is happening. It is happening. And it's, it's uh, you know, with um, uh, bill pay uh, processes, et cetera, all of that good stuff. Um, you got to focus on em uh, employee well-being as well. It, that's a huge focus. Are our employees, how are they? Um, give them also paths to um, success, mm -hmm. training and development. Perhaps there is somebody on your staff that is, uh, has a lot of leadership potential, but needs to be um, skilled up yeah. and and take this opportunity now to to look at that and reevaluate where you are as an organization. You know, I I always love your wisdom. I I you know I have seen you in times of national and civil crisis, my friend, <laughs> and you have come through. And and in on top of all this you work in a sector that deals with crisis yeah. by, the, yeah. by the description of the nonprofit sector. Yeah. yeah. And so I have witnessed you and your team um, be thoughtful and strategic and your hair's never gotten on fire. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you still have your hair. That's even more. Oh, my hair, Julia. And uh, <laughs> yes, it's, uh, but it, it was really like cool. it was a crisis uh, during yeah. the pandemic uh, for all of us, and uh, we're still, you know, I think, as nonprofit sector, still fighting the way out. Yeah. And this is the next crisis: is this staffing uh, problem for nonprofits? And I think nonprofits can do a lot now to plan for and address um, the situation. Yeah. Well, it is always a lovely thing to spend time with you. You're incredibly busy. Jennifer Oliva, um, CPA, the managing partner of your part-time controller. So to get you on the nonprofit show is really powerful because you have a lot of things going on. And so I truly appreciate that you spend this time with us. Check out YPTC.com. They have a, a really robust um, uh, part of their website where they have additional resources. You don't yes. have to be one of their clients. They have- That's uh, right. Webinars. It's all free. Yeah, it's, it's just amazing the different things. Again, I'm Julia Patrick. You'll be joined back with uh, Jarrett Whoa. Ransom tomorrow as we um, explore another Friday Ask and Answered episode of The Nonprofit Show. We want to make sure that we thank all of our partnering sponsors, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Nerd, Fundraising Academy, Staffing Boutique, and Nonprofit Thought Leader. Okay, Jennifer, you know what? You helped me come up with this sign off and I'm still doing it nearly 600 episodes. <laughs> Stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Okay.